that my homily needs to last at least 20 minutes. I've never come anywhere close to 20 minutes, so I'm letting you know this morning I was speaking slower than usual. <laughs> if you listen closely to this morning's Old Testament reading, you'll know that the verse that I just quoted does not appear in the text. It was said almost 2,000 years later. It is part of St. Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin, just before they stoned him. Stephen hits all the highlights of patriarchal history in Acts chapter 7, and he devotes six verses to Joseph. Joseph could interpret dreams that no one else could. Pharaoh recognized Joseph's wisdom and so promoted him to be ruler over Egypt, second only to Pharaoh in power. And due to Joseph's exceptional foresight and administrative abilities, mass starvation in the entire region was averted. It's a blessed life with a Hollywood ending. But that's not where Stephen starts. The very first thing that Stephen says about Joseph is that he suffered. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But Stephen ends the sentence with this, but God was with him. Both of the sides of that are true. When I'm hurt or disappointed or in sorrow, doesn't it seem that God is somehow less with me than when things are going well? With Joseph, we are forced to think about <clears throat> how someone who was so faithful to God was allowed by God to suffer so much, and whether any good can come from suffering, adversity, and trials. This is the key to understanding Joseph's life and gives us a theme for this morning's homily. God is with us in our suffering. We will develop this theme through the interpretive framework of the fourfold sense of Scripture. First, the literal sense. The literal sense of Scripture is this event as history. A summary statement for the literal sense of Genesis 37 is this. God is with us in our suffering, even when he appears absent. So let's turn to the text. Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4. Israel, also called Jacob, had 12 sons, and Joseph was his favorite. And he made this public by giving to Joseph a special robe, his robe of many colors. His brothers were jealous and hated him for this. Although this morning's reading omits verses 5 through 11, here we should note that these verses describe Joseph's two dreams that one day he will rule over his brothers. And this further fueled their jealous hatred. In verses 12 to 17, Jacob sends Joseph to his brothers who are pasturing the flock in Dothan. The remaining verses are about how the brothers seize the opportunity for revenge. Verse 18, they conspired against him to kill him. Now Reuben, the oldest son, persuades them not to kill Joseph, but to throw him into a pit. They later decide to sell Joseph to some Midianite traders on their way to Egypt. Children, I have something special to say to you. If you're working on the coloring sheet for this morning, this is where we are in that story. You see Joseph at the bottom of the pit, and his brother's looking down on him, and one of them holds a bag of money. The camels show that Joseph is about to be sold into slavery and taken into Egypt. This looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Do you think that anything good can come from that? The brother's callousness towards Joseph is punctuated by the short sentence of verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. In verse 32, they return home. How will they account for Joseph not being with them? Their scheme was to dip his robe of many colors in some goat's blood to convince Jacob that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. The brothers twist the knife in by referring to Joseph not by name or even our brother, but is this your son's robe? The reading ends with verse 35. Thus his father wept for him. The literal sense of this passage is about one family's suffering, and there's a lot of it. Joseph suffers betrayal, near death, 
deprivation, and enslavement. Jacob suffers grief over the presumed death of his favorite son. The brothers suffer guilt and regret. This is not evident in the passage. It comes later, as we will see. So in this passage, many characters are mentioned. Jacob, Joseph, his brothers, specifically Reuben and Judah, and some Midianite traders. Do you know who is not mentioned, not even once? God. How often that happens. When we're hurt or uncertain, or when our devotional lives have all but dried up, don't we sometimes ask, Lord, where are you? God's apparent absence in our suffering is itself a source of suffering. But remember what Stephen said, but God was with him. Thus our summary statement for the literal sense, God is with us in our suffering, even when he appears absent. Now to understand how this can be true, we need to go on to the other three senses of Scripture in this passage. Next is the typological sense. Whereas the literal sense is this event as history, the typological sense is this person as a type of Christ. And here's a summary statement for this section. God is with us in our suffering through his blessings. To see this, we must first establish that Joseph is in fact a type of Christ. Now the shared details of the life of Joseph in the earthly life of Jesus are startling, both in their number and their specificity. Here are just a few. Both are beloved of a father and sent by their father. Verse 14 in John 3.17. Both announced they came to seek their brothers. Verse 16 and Luke 19.10. The brothers plotted to kill Joseph. The chief priests and Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus. Verse 20 in John 11:53. Both are stripped of a robe. Verse 23 in Matthew 27:31. Both are betrayed and sold for silver. Verse 28 in Matthew 26:15. Descending to a pit is a biblical metaphor for death. Psalm 30, verse 3. Death and resurrection was metaphorical for Joseph, but for Jesus, it was literal. That Joseph represents Christ is more than an interesting intellectual point. He is the son of Jacob, and he is a figure of Christ. Because later in Genesis, we find out that there was a severe famine in all the land. The grain was available in Egypt. Jacob sends his sons there that we may live and not die. When the brothers arrive in Egypt, they negotiate for food with the governor of Egypt, and so many years have passed that they didn't even recognize that that governor was in fact Joseph. This one man, Joseph, a type of Christ, standing right in front of them, was about to bless them with care, food, and life. The brothers would live through the famine and take grain back to their families. They would eventually resettle in Egypt and flourish. And all of this happened because of Joseph, a figure of Christ. He is the one who mediated all of these blessings to them. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. All our blessings come through Christ because we are in Christ. Whatever relief, no matter how small we experience, during suffering, whether from the sacraments, medical care, the words of an encouraging friend, all of these are mediated through Christ and demonstrate his presence with us. And gratitude and thanksgiving for such blessings reinforces our awareness of this. Number three, the moral sense is about how we should live. A summary statement for this section would be, God is with us in our suffering through his providence. What is divine providence? Since Anglicans believe what we pray, we'll begin with the collect for the eighth Sunday after Trinity, which we prayed just a few weeks ago. It begins, O God, whose never-failing providence ordereth all things, both in heaven and earth. Do you hear the word provide in providence? The words are related. Divine providence is how God provides for, 
orders, sustains, and directs the course of nature and human history. This colic also tells us an important quality of providence. It is never failing. This stands to reason. Since God's power and knowledge are unlimited, his purposes will always be accomplished. Perhaps the most well-known verse about providence is Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We're now ready to develop the moral sense of this passage from two different perspectives of suffering. First, from Joseph's, then his brother's. Keep divine providence in mind as we go through this section. In Joseph, we see suffering caused by others. His brothers conspired to kill him, threw him into a pit, and sold him for some money for some strangers who enslaved him to take him to a foreign land. In recounting this part of Joseph's life, Psalm 105 states, His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. Betrayed by his own family and shackled for weeks on the long journey from Dothan to Egypt, Joseph had every reason to ask, where is God in my life right now? And for the answer, we need to turn to the very last chapter of Genesis. You may want to turn to Genesis chapter 50. By this time in the story, Joseph's brothers have resettled in Egypt to escape the famine and have been reconciled to Joseph. Jacob dies, however, and the brothers now fear that Joseph will at last take his revenge. They ask for his forgiveness. Joseph reassures them in verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is the one of the clearest statements of God's providence found in Scripture. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. We see two things here. The brothers caused Joseph's suffering, and yet God meant it for good. God's gracious providence means that in anything we must endure, he can still bring good out of it. On a practical level, how can we profit from this truth? One way is to think more scripturally about suffering. I'll introduce this topic by referring to a posting this week on the Men's Fellowship Group Me. In his introduction to his homily on Proverbs, St. Basil the Great gives us the analogy of a ship in stormy seas. He advises that the storms of life should be weathered from the crow's nest, which is the very top part of the ship. The crow's nest represents our mind. We must allow the Holy Spirit to work biblical truths into our lives and help us chart a true course. We should not let our feelings have the last word. So there are two lessons here. First, God may not rescue us from the storms of life, but he can always use such storms for our good by giving us more wisdom, trust, and courage. And the second lesson is, be careful what you post on group me. It may end up in that week's homily. <laughs> Since we're on the moral sense of scripture, which is about how we should live, let's consider a practical point. During difficult times, we often turn to the Bible for comfort and reassurance. And there's nothing wrong with this devotional approach. But there's another way of reading scripture which may be even more profitable. When we read inductively, we make observations. We're like scientists gathering data. Read to find more about who God is, our human nature, what God has already done for us, and what he has promised that he will do for us. Read not to feel better, but to know more. We've been talking about the fourfold sense of scripture and catechesis and homily since way back on March 5th. At the very least, this should result in us reading our Bibles more, and if not more, then at least reading them more deeply. Firmly fixing scriptural truths in our minds will aid us during trials. Now we turn to the suffering from the brother's standpoint. This is not talked about often, 
Here we're confronted not with suffering that others cause us, but that we cause others. And we don't see evidence of their suffering in the current passage. We learn only later how much their guilt of how they treated Joseph affected them. Genesis 42, 21, they say to each other, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. How often they felt the crushing shame when they thought of Joseph lying in the bottom of that pit while they casually sat down to eat. With each family gathering, minus one, the guilt would have returned. Whatever happened to Joseph? How could we have done that? And there was absolutely nothing that they could do about it. And they had to live with this for 20 years. But remember the Christ figure, Joseph, who would later pronounce to them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. The but God meant it for good part applied not only to Joseph, but also to them. Their wrongdoings did not thwart God's purposes for Joseph's life or their own. After all, it would be through one of their own line, Judah's, that the Messiah would be born. This morning you may be thinking of some things you've said or done to other people, including loved ones, which you would give anything to take back. There may be regrets over some child-rearing practices, too many words spoken in anger or frustration or impatience, and all those little criticisms which over time can cause deep hurt. Now God's providence doesn't relieve us of our Christian duties. We still need to repent and ask that person to forgive us and seek continually to develop those virtues which would curtail us from hurting others again. But once you've done that, what then? Here we must trust in God's providence, which is always operating, often behind the scenes. Remember that even the hatred of the brothers felt for Joseph was mysteriously used by God in a series of improbable events for good. God can use even our wrongs to bring about good for others and for us. His love and knowledge are more powerful than our sins. We've done, when we've done all that we can do, we must allow any remaining guilt and regret to be swallowed up in God's merciful providence. Now we transition to the fourth sense of Scripture, the anagogical. Here is a summary statement. God is with us in our suffering by giving us hope. Anagogical is from a Greek word which means a climb or an ascent. So the anagogical sense of scripture has to do with our journey to heaven. And in talking about suffering, there's no topic more relevant than hope. Since the absence of hope makes suffering so much worse. I think I could get through this if I just had some hope. Now a common meaning of hope is to wish, as in, um, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Christian hope is different, though. Hope is one of the three theological virtues. The other two are faith and charity. Hebrews 6.19 refers to hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. This is the reason that the most common symbol of hope in Christian art is the anchor. Christian hope is a theological virtue, because it comes from God. It is not something that we try to artificially produce in ourselves. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The abounding hope we have during suffering is a direct result of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. God is present in any suffering by giving us this hope. So how can we develop a greater awareness of such hope? Listen to what the Apostle prayed for the Ephesians. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Did you catch that? 
that you may know what is the hope, not that you would feel hopeful. Hope is primarily something we know, not something we feel. The Apostle Peter reminds us that according to God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance kept in heaven for us. The hope that he gives us during any trial here below is a reminder of the ultimate hope of heaven. To know this hope is an anchor for us during suffering, since this kind of hope comes only from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. Using the fourfold sense of Scripture, we have seen that God is with us in our suffering, even when he appears absent. Moreover, he is with us in our suffering through his blessings, in his providence, and by giving us hope. As Christians, we do not choose suffering. We choose God's will, whether that includes suffering or not. And we believe that it is his will that he can bring good out of anything. How can we be so confident of this? Because no one looking at the horror of the cross that day would have thought that any good could come out of that. But out of the greatest evil, God brought the greatest good, the redemption of the world. That Friday, if you can believe it, we call Good Friday. And what he has already accomplished on a cosmic level on that day, he does not kind in each of our lives every day. Every hurt or sorrow is true, but incomplete. The complete truth is this. There are no tears that fall outside our Heavenly Father's never-failing providence. When through the dark waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.